You are listening to Packers Talk Radio Network. Packers Talk. Eddie Lacy, Mike Daniels, Gilbert Brown, Don Barclay, Micah Hyde, your Green Bay Packers, yesterday's legends and today's superstars. From corporate or nonprofit events to private parties, add some spice. Hire a Packers player from Mayfield Sports Marketing. For details, just go to PackersTalk.com and click on Player Appearances. Are you looking for some signed Packer memorabilia? Look no further than Waukesha Sports Cards. If the Green Bay Packer can sign it, Waukesha Sports Cards has it. Check our website for upcoming Packer player and legend signings. Go to WaukeshaSportsCards.com. What is up, Packer fans? Welcome back to Pack to the Future. I'm your host, Brian Fonfera. And with me, we've got Dusty Evely. Hey, guys. Dusty, how was your Thanksgiving? It was good, man. Spent some time with family. You know, the, the, the kid is about uh, five months old now, so she got to uh, give her first Thanksgiving, spend some time with the cousins, snack on a little turkey. It was a good day. Awesome. Awesome. And we've got Jordan Peck with us as well. Gentlemen. How was your Thanksgiving, you. Jordan? Not that Very anybody good. cares, but how was your Thanksgiving? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, Dad flew into the area. Got to spend time with my brother and his family, niece and nephew, and his wife. Had a great dinner. It was a fun weekend. Awesome. I, I spent this one with uh, just my wife. We've got a lot of family coming in for Christmas, so we decided to go just the two of us for Thanksgiving. But we still made enough food for 12 people. <laughs> <laughs> so our, fruit, our, our fridge is just packed with turkey and stuffing and whatnot. So we've been feasting Wise. every day since. Wise choice. Wise choice. Sounds pretty it, nice. It the, we didn't do any of the shopping until day before because we were so busy. So the smallest turkey I could find was almost 12 pounds. And <laughs> for two people, 12 pounds is a lot of turkey. But, uh, all right. Let's talk football and talk a night that made me cry in two different ways. <laughs> we had the very emotional em- embrace of Bart Starr and Brett Favre. And if, if that didn't make you well up, then you just don't have a soul. I'm sorry, but it's true. And then the Packers made me cry when they couldn't beat the Chicago Bears in Lambeau, in Packer weather, on a night when Brett, Bart Starr and Brett Favre were there. Okay. Setting. Before I start crying again, <laughs> well, let's break it down a little bit. Uh, let's let's start with a Twitter question from our favorite Bears fan, Brian Aviles, who was a was a real pro. He did not rub it in, and I'm very proud of him for that. So thank you, Brian. Thanks, we are hurting Brian. enough. We don't need your help. <laughs> <laughs> so his question. The Bears made some interesting comments after the game about knowing what was coming. Now is it time for McCarthy? And by that, we're assuming he means, is it time for McCarthy to take over the play calling again? So, we've talked about this a little bit, but I think we've got some new things to say. So, Jordan, go ahead. Well, yeah, I think we we brought this question up um, a couple weeks ago, particularly after uh, after the Lions game. It's the same issue. We we didn't talk about it as much last week because, Winning seems to cure a lot of things, but um, it just seems, again, to be an incredible lack of creativity um, in the offense. Um, That was definitely – creativity was definitely the issue with the Lions. With this game, creativity in the passing game, yes, an issue. But in this particular game, you have – in this game, we had success running the ball. And they seem to go away from it for whatever reason. I really have no idea watching that game. Lacey was having a good game. Starks was having a good game. I don't know. I I, I don't know what's up with this offense. I don't know why the receivers can't get on the same page. 
Um, and just to, to reiterate points we made a couple weeks ago is these are issues we haven't had in a few years. Um, and the, the change that was made before the season was, was the play calling duties from McCarthy to Clements. And it's, it's, it's getting old real quick seeing the same stuff week after week and nothing being done about it in the coaching staff. Yeah, I, I can't say I disagree. And Brian's tweet really scares me. If the Chicago Bears, who are one of the worst defenses there around this year, if they can see what's coming and we're that predictable, that's a huge problem. There's no we're way that's bad, sustainable. Bad defense, but good coaching. Vic Fangio is great. So, like, if the, if the talent is down, which it is, but they've got good coaching, like, they can see that. I think that's. I think that, that, that looks like that's what happened. They don't really have yes. any talent on that side of the ball. Yes, but somebody on the field has to be the one to see what's coming. Because when they see what's coming, it's it's making an adjustment at the line of scrimmage. And one of the linebackers or a defensive lineman can see what's about to happen, and they adjust to it. That's, you know, that is, yes, good coaching that they're able to see it, but when it comes down to it, it's the players on the field that are seeing that and making those calls. So if we're that predictable that a really bad defense can exploit us like that, that's bad. And I'm sorry, but if you hold the Bears to 17 points at Lambeau, you need to be winning that game by a lot. It shouldn't have even been close. Dusty, what's your thought? Yeah, basically echo your sentiment. I mean, we, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. I think the same holds true. Yeah, they, I, they absolutely should do that. There's been a huge problem with the offense, which is striking. I know you can point to Nelson being out, which is which is – which is a problem. He's one of the best receivers in the league, so that's that's obviously an issue. But that can't be their only issue. I mean, that, that's not their only issue. They can still be good in spite of that. They still have talent on the offensive side of the ball. So it since they have not gotten better since they've struggled. I mean, they started six and zero, and the talk started talk started you know going on uh, during the zero and three stretch. They were not playing well. Like after the Chiefs game. And even early in the season, they they didn't beat the Bears that much. Mm-hmm. Early in the season, um, they've had issues all season. It's not just been during their zero and three run. They 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 were not mm-hmm. good during that six and zero run. So it's it's been a problem for I don't know over half the season now, which which is a little upsetting, seeing as how we're we're over half well over halfway through the season at this point. So I don't I don't know, man. Um, I. I I think, yeah, it, he, McCarthy should absolutely take over, but if that hasn't happened yet, I don't necessarily think – I don't think it's going to. And that's that's what's upsetting, is that I do mm-hmm. think they could get back not to maybe the numbers they were with Nelson, but they could still be a very effective offense. Sure. If they go back to McCarthy, and that's all you need. The defense is playing well enough. They've got issues. I've got problems with the defense. But defense is playing well enough. Like you said, you hold the Bears a 17 at Lambeau. You should win that. Traditionally, they have. They're not doing it. It's been a problem for way too long. I think they need to go back to McCarthy. But I, me thinking they should and them actually doing it is two different things. I don't think they're going to, but I think they should. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I agree. And it's, I don't know, it's troubling to me. And I'm going to say something right now because, uh, Dusty, you alluded to our game early in the year against the Bears where we didn't win by that much. We didn't look very good, but we grinded it out. I'm going to tell you, in my mind, the, the reason we beat the Bears in week one was because it was a week one, and they had a brand-new coach and two brand-new coordinators, and it was a team that was still figuring things out. If that game at Soldier Field happened in week eight, week 12, week 15, I'm calling that a loss. This Bears team is playing a lot better football than the Packers are right now. As as I said a couple weeks ago when we lost to the Lions, and, and I, was, I was scared about the following two games, and the Bears are just playing better football than we are right now, and it's because their coordinators are doing a lot better job of coaching than our coordinators are. That's where we're losing these games. Mm-hmm. So I I don't think we win at Soldier Field if that game is played later in the year. Yeah, I think that's probably I mean, true. We were we were lucky to play them 
on the road early and steal that win away. Well, and truth, and truth be told, you can look at the other part, other games in the Packers' schedule, like the Seahawks, like the Chiefs, and say the same thing, that we got them at a good time. The Chiefs are rolling. The Seahawks are starting to catch mm-hmm. their stride. So yeah. we're really seeing that maybe the Packers had the luck, a little luck factor in the first few games, and that really that 6-0 record was quite deceiving. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. But and we weren't talking about it because we were 6-0. and What is there to talk exactly. about? We're winning. Right. Winning ugly, winning exactly. pretty, it doesn't matter if you get the win. And now we're not getting the wins, and we're looking back. And, you know, you can go watch those games again. The offense was not in sync. Hasn't been no. all year. And now teams have figured out that, okay, there's no Jordy Nelson. They're not even going to try to throw the deep ball. So let's keep those safeties up. Let's double team the receivers that they do have. Just take everything away, and teams have been able to. Mm-hmm. Even teams that were far better than. You know, and then there there is the issue of Clements. You know, in my mind, he has all the same flaws as a playmaker that uh, Mike McCarthy has, but he doesn't have the same upside. Uh, so we'll talk about one of those flaws is abandoning the run, which uh, McCarthy is famous for. It's it's been a, it's always been a problem. We we get the running game going and we abandon it in the second half, and we lose games because of it. Uh, Dusty, I know you have some stats on this. So I'll let you take over. Yeah, so on the first half, I took out uh, Rodgers scrambling because those are not called plays, and so I, they, they shouldn't factor into the numbers we're looking at. Um, first half, combination of Lacey and Starks went 14 carries, 93 yards, for an average of 6.64 yards a carry, which is tremendous. And the offense was struggling, but they, they were really they, – they were pounding the ball. Lacey looked great. Lacey in particular looked very, very good. Uh, and that first half, Lacey averaged 7.2 yards a carry. Second half, it's down. It's not down as much as I thought it would, but they went, didn't run the ball a ton in the first. It was 14 times, but they ran the ball 10 times in the second half. Seven carries for to Lacey for 33 yards, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but or I think like five minutes into the third quarter, Lacey had four carries for 21 yards, and I don't think he touched the ball again until the, the end of the third quarter. Uh, and then Starks carried the ball three times. And even that second half, total, they carried the ball 10 times for 51 yards for like a 5.1-yard average. For, for the entire game, 24 carries, 144 yards, six yards a carry. And that game where it's really, really nasty out, I, I get that Lacey fumbled, and, and he was out of the game for a little bit, but that was first half. On a night when it was really nasty, it was hard to hold on to passes, to only run 10 times in the second half in a close game for what they did in the mm-hmm. first half is mind-boggling. I, I, just, mm-hmm. I do not understand it. Yeah, and, it, and like you said, a close game. It's not like we were down three scores and needed to make up for that. We needed one or two good, sustained drives, and that's where you need to mix it up and run the ball. And you also mentioned the weather. It was crappy weather, it was raining, it's cold, you have a running game that has been resurgent in the last couple of weeks. Eddie Lacy has looked back to his old self, and it's been fun to watch. And a quarterback who's struggling, receivers who are struggling, a passing game as a whole that's struggling, yet you roll with the passing game instead of the running game. You know, you got to play the hot hand. You know, McCarthy talked about playing the hot hand with Lacy and Starks. You know, whoever's playing well is going to get a majority of the snaps. Well, why doesn't that come down to uh, an offensive unit level? You know, play the hot hand. The running game is working. Don't go away from it. Use it. Yeah, and, and like you said, that was a that was problem. That's been a problem in the McCarthy era, and apparently uh, Clements has some of the same tendencies, and it's it's frustrating to watch. But especially, I mean, mm-hmm. the run. It's one thing that the running game isn't doing well, and you got to pass or you're down, but. Running game was doing good, and it was a close game. It's, I don't, I, I just don't understand how this is still going on, uh, even mm-hmm. under a new play caller. I kind of hope that, I kind of hope that with with Clements in there, it would be a kind of, a kind of a hybrid. Like he'd see what McCarthy did, he'd use what worked, and maybe modify, like tweak the things that that didn't, like the flaws of McCarthy's game. But mm-hmm. instead, those flaws are kind of, to your point, those, those flaws are kind of amplified, mm-hmm. and it's, I don't. I don't understand a ban in the run game, especially in this game, with the weather how it was. Yeah. 
yeah, when it was working. So, mm-hmm. Anything to add, Jordan? Um, I, I, I wanted to propose maybe one question to you guys. I, I can't take credit for this, but I saw it online today. But um, And this would not happen mid-year, but Joe Philbin being available, just fired from Miami a few weeks ago. Do you guys, first of all, do you guys think it's likely that it would have, how, li- how likely would that move be made, bringing him back as O coordinator, or would you guys even want that move? What do you guys think on think that? He, didn't McCarthy go on record as saying that he's a very, he's a good man, but, but he will not be back with us, or something to that effect? I do not recall that. I don't. I re- thought he I don't did. Know. It, it may have been a dream I had. You know, one of my <laughs> one of my weekly Philbin dreams. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure, but. Uh, but yeah, but yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, I I would want him back with the success that he had on his team. Mid season is not happening. I don't really know that it's going to happen. He'll end up he'll end up somewhere else. And Packers being the Packers, they'll just keep keep uh, keep Don Clements for next year and, and say everything's going well, and we'll all be upset. <laughs> but uh, I I wouldn't mind seeing him back. But I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, I I wouldn't mind it, but. My problem with Joe Philbin is he doesn't really solve the some of the issues that we have. You know, Tom Clements isn't a bad offensive coordinator. He's just not a very good play caller, I think, is what yeah. we've learned. With If we're getting a new offensive coordinator, I want a guy who's going to come in and be a motivator and, you know, light a fire under some of these guys. And Edgar Bennett. Philbin's Edgar, Edgar Bennett. Bennett. He'd be good. I mean, he already is technically the offensive coordinator, but you know that job is really Clemens. Mm-hmm. But do you do you do you really do you really want that rah rah guy as your offensive coordinator? Not, I mean, obviously you want you, we want someone like that in the defensive role, which is another topic for another podcast. But um, <laughs> I don't know. The thing with, with the thing about Philbin is he's a he's a detail guy. You know, he's very mm-hmm. very detailed detail oriented, and there's a lot of a lot of little things. I mean, and McCarthy's even said it in a couple of post-game press conferences. It's, it's the whole system is not broke. There's just a bunch of little things that are that are broke that needs to get fixed. And a guy like Philbin, a little more detail-oriented, might be able to fix those problems. So, yeah, that, no, the, you, you have a good point. And and no, I don't want like a big rah-rah guy. You know, like Rex Ryan, Rob Ryan type. <laughs> you know, jumping up and down and screaming at people. I don't want that kind of offensive coordinator, but, you know, you have Mike McCarthy already who's so calm, heart rate always down, like never panic. You know, I I wouldn't mind a guy who will panic every once in a while. And, you know, it just kind of to be the the yin to Mike McCarthy's yang, just offer something else. And, you know, maybe if the offense looks to the sideline and see, okay, coach is upset something's going wrong, we need to fix it, you know, instead of looking at a straight face all the time. Yeah. And, you know, if if I'm if I'm a player and I'm looking to the sideline and my coach doesn't look like anything is urgent, I'm not going to feel like anything is urgent. So, you know, just kind of to offer something a little bit different, I, that's what I would like to see if we replace Tom Clemens. But uh, I don't think that's going to happen anyway. Let me, no, throw, no. let me throw a name out there. I think someone that would be perfect for that role. His name is Dusty Evely. He's available okay. now. Just you know, All you got to do is give him a call. He's got a little bit of fire to him, but he also pays attention to little things. I think, yeah, I think you're a perfect fit for the offense. Um, and I know Mike, Mike McCarthy, I know you're listening. Um, you can just give him a call anytime. Cool. It would add, you want to put his phone number would, out there? No, he's got it. He's, I know got he's it. got it. <laughs> it would add an incredible amount of credibility to our to our podcast if the offensive coordinator was a co-host. So I, I, I like that idea. <laughs> what? What? Yeah. So just don't forget us, little people, when you're rich and famous. You know oh, what? I don't make I don't make any promises. You guys don't live in Green Bay. I I can't really make that promise. That is you. <laughs> <laughs> the whole point of our show is three dudes that don't live anywhere near Green Bay, Wisconsin. I say it almost every week. <laughs> Touche. Come on now, don't get all. You're already getting all high and mighty on us, and he hasn't even called you yet. <laughs> it's a matter of Dude. time. Matter of time. Does not, does not bode well. All right. 
<laughs> Moving on a little bit, uh, another issue that I've seen with uh, Tom Clements, or maybe the offense as a whole, this might be all the way as high as McCarthy, but players being used maybe not out of position, but in ways that do not emphasize their strengths. And our biggest example is Richard Rodgers. Now, in my mind, Richard Rodgers is a, a, he's a red zone tight end. He's got good hands. He's strong. You know, he can make an athletic play every once in a while as long as the ball's not in his hands. You know, that's where you want him. And we're using him in bubble screens and in the flat in all these places between the 20s where he is just failing time after time and we keep trying the same things over and over. And it blows my mind. And I know it blows your guys' mind too. Jordan, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, I mean, yes, it's, <laughs> then if it's for a few weeks, anytime you see Rogers split out into the slot, it's just like, oh, it's just, a, it's just a waste. I mean, what, what do you, what, you just got to imagine what every defense is thinking when they see that. It's just like, all right, we'll put a linebacker over there and that's nothing's going to happen there. And we'll f- send our focus anywhere else. It's, 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 it's silliness. It's just, it's just silliness. Nothing has come of it between the twenties. He, he's been productive in the red zone. And that's great. And there's a there's a role for that on any team to have that weapon. But he should not be a primary receiving threat for this team. Um, mm-hmm. That is that. I, I don't know what you guys have to really say more about 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 Rogers there. But I mean, it's and we've talked about it before. It's 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 infuriating. It's very infuriating to see it happen week after week. It is. It is. And I, I know Dusty has an interesting theory. But first, I just want to say. I understood, I understood using him between the 20s, you know, for a few weeks after Andrew Corliss went down, who practiced this week and hopefully will be active on Thursday. That would be a big boost, I think. But, you know, he went down and we didn't really have anybody. You know, but then we called up uh, Justin Perillo, who's actually been playing pretty well and seems like he could be that between the 20s guy in a, on a limited basis. And you could save Richard Rodgers for where he's actually performed well. And now if Corliss is back, hopefully, you know, I, as Dusty said, McCarthy is listening, so hopefully he'll mm-hmm. take advantage of Andrew Corliss and use him in, in the role that Rodgers has struggled in. Um, so, Dusty, let, let's hear this interesting theory of yours. Well, I got a couple things first. So, like, Corliss, I, I don't really know that Corliss is, is a better player, than Richard Rodgers, but I think they use him better. I think the way they use mm-hmm. Corliss is about the way they should use Richard Rodgers, and I, it, it blows my mind how they're using Richard Rodgers. So that's that's one of them. Richard Rodgers, that's that's number one, and then I got one more, and then my theory. So the second one is Richard Rodgers should be used as Corliss was used, which was basically Bubba Franks. It's middle of the field guy. Mm-hmm. Like you said, you can use him between the 20s, but it's, it's over the field. It's like, I don't know, four-yard curls and like just just a like a short post or something like a dig like just something where you you find a hole in the zone and you sit there. That's how he should be used. How he's being used, which leads to my theory. My theory is that Tom Clements wrote up a whole bunch of plays designed to go to Ty Montgomery, thinking Montgomery is going to be a big part of the offense. And then Montgomery got injured and has been in for longer than anyone thought he'd be injured. So Clements finally just said, "You know what? I'm using these plays." So he basically just crossed off Ty Montgomery's name off the play sheet and put Richard Rodgers in that. I know we've talked about this before. I can't remember what game. This may have been the Panthers game. Ran a wide receiver screen to get Richard Rodgers in space. It wasn't even like like a stacked receiver thing. He was, he was lined up in the slot like five yards away from anyone else. He takes a step back while the receiver is blocking. And one of the receivers was Randall Cobb. The goal was to get Richard Rodgers in space and have Randall Cobb block. And there's some, like, I don't even like saying that sentence. That sentence makes me ill. But if that's Tom Montgomery, mm-hmm. that's perfect. That's exactly right. where he needs to be used. They got him lined up in the backfield. Like, in no huddle, they've got him lined up in the backfield, which is exactly where I wanted Tom Montgomery from the second they drafted him. So they're going to use him in the third. no huddle, backfield, him and Cobb. Instead, it's Rodgers and Cobb in the backfield. Rodgers in the slot. It's not Rodgers in the middle of the field. It's Rodgers running to the flat with his back to the defense. Even if he makes the catch, 
he's getting hit like within two yards of the line of scrimmage. But if you if you just every time you see Richard Rogers out there in the slot, just picture Ty Montgomery. And the uh, the more I think about it, the more I think this theory makes perfect sense. <laughs> Guys, are let me know if you're down for this. Maybe we should turn this into a drinking game where you have to drink an entire <laughs> beer every time Richard Rogers is lined up in the slot. If that's the case, you guys will all be dead by this time next week. So it was a really good run. We had a really good run. And alcohol poisoning runs rampant in Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Um, so, so on the subject of receivers, a lot of flack being given to Devontae Adams this week, and deservedly so. He's had, he had one of the worst games he's had as a pro and overall has just been disappointing this year. I want to deflect a little bit off of that. We were talking a little bit before the show about lazy route running, and Aaron Nagler did a great job posting a lot of vines of him. Of uh, He was watching the coach's film and showing Jeff Janis running lazy routes and Cobb running lazy routes and, and just everything like that. Everyone's lazy. And, you know, if a, if a receiver like Devontae Adams is having that bad of a day, where he's dropping balls, quitting on routes, but the ball is still being thrown to him, that tells me that he is the most open receiver consistently. And his routes have been really poor. So I ask, what does that say about the other receivers? If if your worst receiver on the day is getting by far the most targets, why isn't anyone else getting targets? No one is open. Any thoughts it's on pretty, that, guys? It's pretty sobering. I mean, he, he got the most targets. He had 10 targets. Uh, Randall Cobb actually had seven, and Cobb turned his seven targets into six catches, while Devontae Adams turned his 10 targets into two receptions for 14 yards and three drops, yeah. which was upsetting. So it wasn't necessarily by far, but it was the most. So that it is, it's, it's sobering. It's kind of depressing. I'm, I'm looking at these numbers right now as far as targets and receptions and what they did with them, and it's it makes me really sad. Mm-hmm. And, and to bring up the play calling again, if the wide receivers are to be believed, you know, we're, we're on that final drive, you know, first and goal from the eight, and apparently Tom Clements took all the receivers and said, hey, guys, run into the end zone and stand perfectly still. <laughs> That's exactly what they did. Those routes were atrocious. It, yeah, they they showed the um, ISO cams on each receiver. I think it was on the third down play, and it was Cobb on a linebacker, not even trying to get open. And I and I love Randall Cobb, but that was that was depressing to watch. If if I was Aaron Rodgers, I think just to send a message. I'd have thrown an interception on purpose. <laughs> Just be like, guys, okay, you stood still. I threw it at you, and it got picked off. What do you know? Why don't you move your asses a little bit? I'd like to think I, that's I what he did. On, I'd like to think that's what he did on his lone interception of the uh, of the game. <laughs> He's like, hey, Devontae, you were supposed to, you were supposed to be here. I threw it there, and look what happened. But didn't other than work maybe the the Chip Kelly. Other than maybe Chip Kelly, head coach of the Eagles, I don't know if there is possibly a more pissed-off person in the NFL right now than Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> the man is just, he's been getting hit a ton lately with poor protection from his offensive line. And when there is protection, nobody's open because receivers aren't running routes. That guy has to be so angry right now. First of all, I'm going to go ahead and say that Greg Hardy is probably angrier, just just because. <laughs> but I mean, and, and I think you're right. But uh, it, that also takes a lot of blame off of Rodgers. Not to say that he deserves all the blame, but he deserves some of it because he he's been missing throws. He's been slow to read. He's been slow to get the ball out. Um, he just doesn't look quite right. And some of that is the way the offense is performing. The receivers not getting open. Said the offensive line not protecting. Like it, it comes down to that. But I, I don't want to take blame completely off of him because he's had his own issues this season. Yep. Yeah. No, it's true. For sure. Well, some of that can go to play calling, though. It would have been really nice if 
the play caller would have helped out his quarterback by running the ball more and, and getting guys into a rhythm because that's what happened in Minnesota. We ran the ball more and more. The offense got into a rhythm because the defense didn't prepare for both things. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. I got a phone call from uh, a good friend of mine, John Jameson, who I, I never know if he listens or not to our podcast. <laughs> He likes to call me and say what's going to be on the podcast this week and kind of get my thoughts out that way instead of actually listening to us, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But he he called me with uh, two questions. We'll we'll start with, uh, he started with, will the Packers miss the playoffs? And I'm not ready to say that we're going to miss the playoffs. You know, I, I can't, a team that's coached by Mike McCarthy, who is a very good coach, he's stubborn. To, as hell, and it annoys us, but he is a very good coach. And we have Aaron Rodgers, who is a very good quarterback, one of the best in the league, if not the best, even if he's not playing like it right now. So it's hard for me to say, but I look at our schedule and I can very easily see us going 8-8, eight and 9-7, eight, and seven and missing out. So I couldn't say with confidence that no, we won't. So give me your thoughts on that, Dusty. Will the Packers miss the playoffs? No, I mean, for all the issues we've had, and, you know, I mentioned earlier that it, even during the 6-0 and run, we were having issues. We're still sitting 7-4. and Yeah, we've got some tough games coming up. we got, obviously, the Lions this week in Detroit, uh, the Cowboys in Lambeau with, particularly Matt Castle, I guess. Uh, Matt Castle at the helm, so that doesn't really scare me. At Oakland and at Arizona is a little scary, and then Minnesota, we close out the season with Minnesota and Lambeau. I could I could see I mean yeah to your point eight and eight's possibility I keep I keep hoping and that's that's on me that's on me that I keep hoping I keep thinking that they're gonna pull themselves out of this that, that the team that we know can play well on offense is going to show up at some point um, and they're gonna turn it around I keep thinking sure. that's gonna happen sure. which which gets them to I don't know ten, ten and six eleven and five maybe, um, if they if they turn around this week. Uh I, I, I still see them making the playoffs. Sitting at seven and four uh is still pretty good. That's still good considering the season. I mean it, it's if the season ended today, which I, w- I always hate when people say that, but if the season ended today it's wild card um playing in Washington. Like that's not bad. Uh mm-hmm. I think they'll turn it around. I think they'll be fine. They'll make the playoffs even if it's a wild card. I I don't think they're gonna miss the playoffs. All right, Jordan. No, nah, if they go, they go two and three. Even if they only win two of their games, very good chance nine and seven even gets you in as a wild card. Um, I don't think they even go nine and seven. I think I think ten and six is their. I think ten and six is their um, most most uh, most likely end of the season record. Um, and that'll definitely get in as a wild card. And if we beat, you know, if if we beat Minnesota last week of the season. That's probably that's probably going to be enough to win the division. Minnesota doesn't have the easiest schedule either, um, mm-hmm. so I, no, I, I I do not see the Packers um, missing the playoffs. I I I'd say right now, based on the way they're playing, I think there's a lot more likely chance they're a wild card than a than hosting a uh, playoff game. But I I don't see them missing out. I don't. All right. Okay. So the second question he asked me was: Is Mike McCarthy in trouble? And I think it's absurd to say, is he in trouble after 10 good years to say, is he in trouble after four bad games? So let's let's kick it a little bit and say the scenario is the Packers do miss the playoffs. So we start 6-0, and we end, say, 8-8 eight and eight and, or 9-7, and seven and we miss the playoffs. Is Mike McCarthy in trouble, Jordan? No. And it's because of our general manager. This I mean, Ted Thompson is not a guy to make a quick decision. A quick, I mean, he has not made many quick decisions in terms of free agency. He certainly hasn't made quick decisions in, when it comes to coaching. Now, and you said it before, McCarthy's had a very good run, so there's, obviously his job has never been in jeopardy. But even with one season like this, and as disappointed as it may be, it's not going to be enough for Thompson to say, all right, Mike, we're, we're going to let you go and, and go somewhere else. Because first of all, where are you going to go? I mean, is, is there really anybody out there you'd rather have than Mike McCarthy right now? 
as a Packer fan. I mean, obviously some Packer fans will, you know, throw out names and say, oh, well, this is just what we need. But, I mean, give me a break. McCarthy's, mm-hmm. the, McCarthy's the best option going into the next year, playoffs or not. It's, it's, oh, yeah. it's, there's no question to me. Yeah, I agree. Um, there's, there's nobody available that's better. You know, even if Sean Payton loses his job, He's not better than Mike McCarthy. That's been proven. You know, the only coach out there I might rather have would be a guy like Bill Belichick, but you know he's not going anywhere. So right. that's not even a conversation to have. So, no, I don't think Mike McCarthy's in trouble. Hopefully, his coordinators will finally be in some trouble. That's my hope. Mm-hmm. I, I don't want McCarthy to be in trouble. We can we can finish 7-9. and nine. We can lose the remaining five games on our schedule. And I, I don't want McCarthy gone. I, I do want a new defensive coordinator, and I would like a change in offensive coordinator if that happens. But no, there's I, I don't see a scenario where McCarthy's in trouble, Dusty. No, and I mean you mentioned the six and zero start. That it, not to say this is you know absolutely going to happen because this was a different team. But uh, and Josh McDaniels' first year in Denver, he six and zero. They went eight, they ended the season eight and eight, missed the playoffs. He came back the next year, fired halfway through the next season, and that was in his first season. They didn't fire him after the first season after going six and zero and missing. And that was not with Ted Thompson at the helm. So you know, um I think I, I think they could lose out. I think they go seven and nine. Um McCarthy's maybe on a shorter leash. Maybe you're looking at uh maybe if the same thing happens next year he's gone. But I don't even think I, I mean I wouldn't even think if he went seven and nine this year got off to a bad start next year. He's not even getting fired mid season. And and to your point, Brian, yeah, I don't know I don't know who he'd want besides McCarthy. I don't I the the names out there, maybe there's some new up and comer or something, but even then I wouldn't feel comfortable with it. McCarthy's done good. He's got a track record of being good. One bad season I d I don't think deserves him get getting the axe. But to your point, yeah, I think if that happens some coordinator should get the axe. I I was talking to my brothers about this. I think I'd be perfectly okay with one bad season if it means there's going to be some turnover within the coaching staff. Like if we went seven and seven or seven and nine and or went eight and eight, missed the playoffs this year, and it meant Capers was finally gone, mm. I think I'd be okay with that because that meant we'd be better going forward. Mm. Um, Preach, so I, I don't think McCarthy's Preach. in trouble, but I I think some other people should be in trouble if that happens. But McCarthy will be fine. <sighs> When when you said you wanted Capers gone, all I could hear in the background was a gospel choir humming. <laughs> Music. I got that ears. same thing. Just you know, this is just the most. You know, even if we do perform well the rest of the year, this is the most underachieving Packers team we've seen in a long time. And the talent is there. For us to be in the conversation with Carolina and New England right now, where we have 9 to 11 wins somewhere in there, the talent is there. The coaching, not so much. And Absolutely. Everybody, everybody I talk to brings up, we lost Jordy Nelson. And yes, that hurts an offense, but I don't buy it. It, it feels like such a cop-out to me for someone to say, this offense will be a lot better when Jordy Nelson's back. And yes, it will. But, you know, look at you know, New England every year has major injuries on offense. Their offensive line, they're missing like three of their top four tackles, and their offensive line is performing better than the Packers' offensive line is. And they've got all five starters in the lineup every week. You know, their receivers are doing pretty damn well, and that's been without Julian Edelman recently. And then, uh, you know, Danny Amendola got hurt, and they were still moving the ball until Gronk went down. And that was in Detroit, in uh, Denver against a good defense in bad weather. So, no, one injury cannot be an excuse for why your offense is struggling. Just can't, unless that injury is Aaron Rodgers. Well, even and, I'm, and even to go along with the point you're bringing up the Patriots this year, you can go back to the Patriots when, uh, when Brady injured out for the season, first quarter of the year. What was their record? They went 11-5 and five with Matt mm-hmm. Castle as their yeah. quarterback. <laughs> I mean, a very I'm talented sorry. team, but Matt Castle is their quarterback, and they won 11 games. And here so we are. Matt at, Castle at is what, four and four this year as the as the Cowboys starter. Matt Matt Castle has been horrible every every other place he's gone to. He had that yeah. one great season. It was it was it was a Matt Flynn kind of, except it was a full yeah. season. But 
He had that one great run, got his paycheck, and he has been absolutely horrible since. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, let's let's move on from from that terrible night. All I'll remember is the halftime ceremony. I'm just going to block the rest out of my mind, and and we're going to move on. Deal. Deal. All right. Deal. (laughs) All right, so let's move on. We're we're against Detroit again, this time in Detroit. I'm going to pass things over to Jordan, who's going to talk with uh, Marlo Alter, who we very much appreciate joining us again. All right, we are uh, pleased to welcome back Marlo Alter from the Detroit Free Press once again. Marlo, how are we doing tonight? Hey, thanks for having me on again. Oh, no, pro- no, no problem. We're glad to have you. Um, second time. In uh, four weeks, the Packers are playing the Lions. Um, when you look at this Lions team, what's what different has has really um, changed since since that first game a couple weeks ago to, to this to this week? What's what's changed with the Lions team? I think uh, I think they're playing a little looser right now. Um, you know, after the firing of the, the GM and the president, um, they just seem to be playing kind of with a nothing to lose attitude. Um, you know, there's not a lot, really a lot of pressure on them um, since they already dug such a huge hole. You know, it, it couldn't get much worse than it already was. So I think they're playing looser. I think they've got some more confidence now after that, that Green Bay win a few weeks ago, which pretty you know shocked pretty much everyone um, to end that to end that Wisconsin losing streak. So I think they're just <laughs> they're loose. They're they're confident, and um, you know, they're Matthew Stafford's. You know, he's He's playing up to par, um, and he's been a lot better recently. So um, I think those are those are probably some of the key differences since the last time we talked. Would you would you attribute it mostly to the changing of the offensive coordinator, the fact that Lombardi's gone and and Jim Bob Gooder stepped in? Um, I definitely think that has something to do with it. Stafford's kind of you know they've let him loose a little more, you know, like he used to be in the past. Um, it's just. The the offense is a little more wide open. Um, you know they're running the ball better, a little bit better at least. Uh, they made a change at right tackle, taking uh, Le- Adrian Waddle out. They've got Michael Ola in, um, so he's been doing an okay job at least. So I think they're protecting a little better. I think they're running the ball um, more efficiently, um, not not necessarily more effectively, but you know, they're getting, you know, instead of three yards a carry, they're getting three and a half, four, and I think that's opened up the passing game a little, and Jim Bob Cooter's, you know, done a nice job keeping defenses off balance. I agree. I agree. Um, I don't know what, what uh, kind of vibe you've gotten from other, other Lions fans or really uh, what, 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 the, what the confidence level is in the fans in this team or the, just the confidence level in the team with a, um, a playoff spot kind of, not to say it's within total reach right now, but if they can go on a bit of a run, it's it's eight and eight, nine and seven could be enough in the NFC to grab a wild card. How feasible do you think that is? Um, do you see this team continuing that kind of success, this kind of play? Um, you know, if you had asked that a couple of weeks ago when when they were one and seven, you know, people would have laughed at you. But right now, I mean, it's. It's out there. I mean, their story's being written. Um, you know, they do have a a fairly favorable schedule. I, you know, the Packers are their toughest opponent remaining. You know, they got the Rams, the Saints, the Niners, and Bears, all winnable games, but three of them are on the road. So, um, I, I mean, I don't think it's a realistic shot, um, but, I mean, the NFC is just so bad, and I guess the NFL in general, you know, there's only a handful of uh, teams with a winning record, so. They have a shot, um, and I think the fans have been kind of torn about, you know, whether they should just tank the rest of the season away and, you know, get a top five pick. But, um, you know, with the three games in a row that they've won, and people are starting to believe again that, you know, this is the team that they thought they were, you know, that they had hoped for at the start of the year after the 11-win season last year. So I think people are starting to believe that, it, that hey, maybe, maybe these guys can, can uh, win a couple more games, and you never know what's going to happen in, in the NFL. 
Which of the uh, remaining Lions games are on the road? I'm, I'm just, I, I, I don't have the schedule in front of me. Maybe you, if you, if you remember uh, which, which know, of those games are playing. They got, yeah, they got the Packers, obviously, on Thursday. Then they play at St. Louis and at New Orleans, two teams who have fallen off the map. And then they've got the Niners at home, and then they finish at Chicago, which um, obviously the Bears are playing much better. So that that's a tough game. Okay. Um also, news today, oh, I think it was yesterday, you had uh, Calvin Johnson uh, limited in practice. Um, that's kind of become commonplace with him just as he's gotten older. But today, um, sat out from the practice completely. Is that, um, do you see that more as a precaution, or do you see that as, as, a, as a cause for concern for him not being able to play on Thursday? Yeah, you know, he's been dealing with the nagging ankle um, pretty much um, since since the early part of the season, you know, he's practiced on and off. So I I would be shocked if he doesn't suit up, especially with everything on the line again this week. Um, and, you know, they, they have they do have, uh, you know, it's been seven days off, even though it's another Thursday game. Obviously, Green Bay and Detroit both play on Thanksgiving, so it's not a short week. So um, I, I, I think he'll be all right. I think it's just more of a maintenance kind of deal. Gotcha, gotcha. So looking ahead just to, to this Thursday, what is, if you can boil it down to one thing, what, what is the one thing that the Lions have to do in order to beat the Packers on Thursday in, in Detroit? I think um, I think if they can get some pressure on Aaron Rodgers, um, you know, like they did a little bit in, uh, in the Green Bay game, you know, Ziggy Ansah has been on fire. You know, he had three and a half sacks against Philadelphia. Um I think he's up there in, uh, near the leaderboard in terms of sacks. Um, if if someone else can can step up opposite him, you know, Haloti Nod has been playing a lot better recently, uh, mostly in the run game. But I think that's really the key. If they can get some pressure on on Aaron Rodgers, um, I think that they have, they have a real shot. Um, although you know the Packers have been running the ball better too, so that makes that makes it a, a more dangerous offense when you when you can run the ball and pass the ball. But yeah. Pressuring Rodgers, I think, uh, would be would be very helpful. Yeah, I looked this up actually just earlier today, Ziggy. I, I don't think he got a sack against Aaron last week, but he had three hits on him, and they were causing Aaron a lot of lot of issues last week or uh, last game, I should say. So, and he's going up against uh, our our left tackle, David David Bakhtiari, who's not had a very very uh, impressive season. He hasn't been horrendous, but he has been. Uh, Far far worse than he's than he showed in the past. So yes, that's a definite definite cause for concern for the Packers. So, all right. Yeah, um, I mean, I would expect them, you know, to try and help out, you know, chip a little on that side because you know the Lions don't really have anyone else other than Ansa. So I'd be I'd be surprised if if they let him beat them, beat them. Nothing nothing would surprise me about this Packers team anymore. So I'm, I'm <laughs> not ready to say that they will do do such things, but we will we will see. <laughs> All right, um, Marla. So I, if we've we've boiled down to that, so what? How do you, how do you see this game going? What's what's your score prediction? How do you how do you see this uh, this game faring out on uh, on Thursday? I think the Lions have a real shot, uh, like most people. I do think that the Packers, um, you know, they played much better on the road against Minnesota two weeks ago. So, you know, maybe being on the road helps them a little bit. You know, they don't. They don't have to worry about it, you know crowd pressure, you know any booze from their own team and whatnot. I, so that that may help Green Bay a little bit um, in a twisted way. So <laughs> I think I think they uh, I think they they have the backs against the wall, um, and I think uh, Green Bay pulls it out. I I still think that, you know they're a more talented team than Detroit. They got the better quarterback, even though Rodgers has been up and down. Um, I still wouldn't bet against him. So. I'll take Green Bay. I think it's going to be a close game, probably a low-scoring game. I'll say 23-20, to 20, Packers win. All right, fantastic stuff. Again, this is uh, Marlo Alter from the Detroit Free Press. You can follow him on Twitter at, at Marlo, M-A-R-L-O-W-E, Alter, A-L-T-E-R. Marlo, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining us again. Hey, Ann. Thanks again. We'll be watching. All right, have a good one. So thank you very much again to Marlo Alter, an awesome guy. Glad to have him on our show again. Look forward to talking to him again next year. All right.
Guys, let's talk Lions Packers. And uh, Dusty, kick us off. What are you looking for this week? Man, I'm looking for if the run game's working, you just stick with it. Um, I'm looking for a resurgence in the passing game. Hopefully, uh, I, I feel like I've been saying this every week. Like, I at some point, I assume they're going to figure it out and they'll be fine, or not fine, but at least they'll move the ball. Um, and I, I, I kind of am hoping. I kind of think that's going to be this week. Now the Lions held them back the last time. I think they'll be able to move the ball this week. Um, I. I, I honestly just don't even know what to say anymore. <laughs> you know, just keep with what's going well. I think that uh, it's a different Lions team than we're facing. I mean, you know, it's it's the same Lions team. And granted, they were going up against a, a uh, disinterested Philly team on Thanksgiving, but they hung 45 up on Philly a couple weeks ago. So it's a different offense than we're looking at. Um, I, I do think the Packers' defense will show up, get some pressure. They didn't. I don't think they sacked Stafford, or they sacked, they sacked him once when we played him. Uh, I think they'll get. I think no, they'll get some pressure. Didn't. They, they didn't. They no. got pressure on him, but he was moving. Mm-hmm. I, I think they'll get pressure on him. They'll make a move. I think they're going to hit him. I think they'll get a couple sacks. Uh, defensive line has been picking up a little lately. Um, Mike Daniels. I mean, it's, it's no surprise. Mike, Mike Daniels has been a monster. Pepper's been playing well the past couple weeks. Uh, I, I think they're going to get in there. I think they're going to get hits. I don't think the Lions are going to score a whole lot of points. The key is that the Packers need to score more than the 16 they scored in Lambeau against Detroit. So mm-hmm. stick, go with the running game. Just pound them. I think, I think they'll, they'll find success there. Uh, pass when you have to. Uh, don't rely on the passing game to get you there because there's obvious issues there. It's the lazy route running, drop passes, uh, pressure on Rodgers, especially I don't know what the, what the prognosis is on, on Bulaga. Is he playing this week? Do we know? I've heard mixed reports. I really don't know. Well, Barclay actually held his own over there, so I, I don't I don't know that I feel comfortable saying Barclay is going to be going to be fine over there. Treader has been great at center. I think he's been very good there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if they can keep the pressure off Rodgers, it's tough it's tough to say because the passing game hasn't been crisp. But they will move the ball through the air a little bit. Uh, they should be able to run. I, I just don't know, man. I, I I think I've got too much hope pregame, and they just <laughs> crush me in game. So that that's kind of what I'm looking for. Just just. Find something that works well early and just keep going to it, and 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 they're not going to do it. But that, that's what I would like to see. <laughs> um, yeah, I I could talk for an entire podcast about how you know I've, I've heard several people say that the defense performed pretty well this week. I disagree. I don't approve of the job they did. You know, they made Cutler look good. And this is the one defense that's been his Achilles heel. He's never been able to solve it, and he solved it this week. No interceptions. I think he was sacked only once, something like that, Quentin Rollins. And the, you know, the only thing I'm going to say defensively, so I don't go on a crazy rant about Dom Capers, is it is so far beyond time for some of these young guys to get bigger chances. You know, Quentin Rollins has gotten a a little bit of a chance lately, but only because of injuries, and you know that if everybody's out there healthy, he's going to be riding the bench again. But he's performed, I think, better this year than Micah Hyde has. So Micah Hyde being healthy gets all the playing time instead of Quentin Rollins. And, you know, Nate Palmer continues to struggle, gives up yardage to tight ends, he misses tackles, he's the second, third, fourth player in there when a tackle is made. And, you know, Jake Ryan is just the exact opposite. He's the first guy there most of the time, and he has earned the chance to up his playing time every week. And it just doesn't happen. You know, we talked, I I mentioned earlier, Mike McCarthy saying going with a hot hand at running back. Well, that is the only position on this entire football team where we seem to go with the hot hand. You know, maybe now kick returner because he said Jeff Janis is going to be doing more of that. But nowhere else are we talking about go with the hot hand. And it is well beyond time that those two guys get their opportunity. And so so I'm going to go back to offense. That's all I have to say on the defense because I'm just going to go off otherwise. The offense has to be where there's a turnaround. You know, we're used to this defense being inconsistent. You know, the offense has been our anchor for a long time, and these receivers 
I don't know what needs to happen. If it is preparation, you know, Rogers mentioned to the media, which he, he doesn't do, you know, he, so he must be pretty upset about guys preparation because he called it out in the media and, you know, he said they're you know, spending too much time playing video games. You know, their preparation on the practice field isn't good enough. And when it's not good enough, you know, that's okay as long as you go home and compensate for that. You know, do more preparation on your own. But nobody seems to be doing that. And because of that, we've got receivers and a quarterback who are not on the same page more often than not. And it has, it's shown. You know, McCarthy said, you know, they practice well, but there is no proof of that on Sunday or in the past two weeks case Thursday there's just no proof that this team is practicing well so I don't want to hear another press conference from McCarthy saying everything's fine everything's fine you know we're practicing well it just has to come together on game day you know that's it's bullshit it's just not true anymore things have to change and it has to start from the top and go all the way down Jordan um I mean, to talk about you guys, the, the, the running game, if, if L- Lacey appears to be in, in good form. He's had two good games in a row. He's running hard. He's hitting holes hard, breaking tackles, doing what he's done the first couple of years that he's been in the league. Um, if, if, if that's working again, then, yes, they absolutely need to keep doing that. They need to learn their lesson from, from Thanksgiving and, and keep giving him the rock, get, get him and Starks going, um, and run our offense through them. I mean, it's just if, if that's what's working, then that's what you've got to do. Um, no, that's if, if if the passing game has another game like they did, even if even if it's in a lesser role, it's going to be real tough to beat the line. So you need to have sent anybody, it, it, Rick Cobb, uh, Jones, just just anyone step up and make some big catches, like Jones did in the Vikings game. Had a couple big grabs, a touchdown catch. I mean, it was a great throw from Rodgers, but I mean, for him to take for him to bounce in the end zone there, get that catch, that was huge for us at that moment. That was that was great. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, just, just one of these receivers to step up and just say, Hey, I'm taking over. I'm getting open every time. Roger's going to put on the money and, and we're, we're going to have a game. Nobody did that against the Lions the first time. Nobody did it against the bears on Thanksgiving. If that happens on Thursday, then I, then I like our chances. The, the defense, it's, um, if, if we're able to get pressure on then, then good. If, if Stafford has time, it, it could be a real long day. It could be a real long day. He, uh, has had quite a, few games in a row where Stafford has looked very good and he still has Calvin Johnson who's still one of the best mm-hmm. um so there's there's definitely cause for concern so I'm very nervous about this game but there are just a couple if, if a couple things go our way um I I, I like our chances I, would, yeah. I do want to tack out one point so I know Brian I don't want you to have a meltdown I want to mention something about the defense and that Bears game this was a stat for, I was going to look this up myself, but someone on Twitter did it for me, which is great. Um, this was the uh, Twitter uh, Packer report, was at Packer report. Uh, he said the Packers had 118 yards after a catch in the second half on wide receiver screens, which is preposterous. They just, Bears kept running those, and the Packers didn't have an answer for them. Apparently, they had never seen them before, had no idea how to cover them. If the Lions do that and the Packers had do not adjust or have not adjusted, Golden Tate's going to have like 300 yards receiving in this game. Mm-hmm. And, and that yeah, cannot and, stand. And you know what the difference was? I, I, I think back to one of those screens to a receiver in particular was very close to being picked off, but the receiver yeah. came crashing on that ball. He did, yeah, yeah that, he, was, uh, he that was Hayward. He sprinted yeah. to it. Mm-hmm. Hayward almost had it picked, but that guy sprinted to the ball to make sure it was not picked off. And a lot of Aaron Rodgers' incompletions were because receivers failed to do exactly that. You know, James mm-hmm. Jones would run a cutback route, and he would turn around, be right there, the ball is coming, and Jones stops and waits for it and gives the cornerback time to come and knock the ball down. Whereas if he takes one step towards that ball, He completely negates whatever the cornerback is doing. He's not going to get a hand on it, and it's either going to be a catch or it's going to be a penalty because that cornerback's going to run into him, and good things are going to happen. But it goes back to that lazy route running where, you know, they're coming back on the ball, but they're not running to it. And it's cost us a lot of yards, and it's cost us touchdowns. And Aaron Rodgers threw 
an interception because of a poor route that a guy uh, Devonte Adams just quit on. Yeah. A, a deep ball was thrown to Devonte Adams, and he just stopped running halfway through <laughs> it for yeah, no did. reason. You know, yeah, that's a he, touchdown right there. If he I keeps just running, that. I think that was in the first quarter. He was even before he quit running, he was jogging on that route anyway. Yeah, it, it just why aren't you running? That's an easy touchdown. He had that cornerback beat. Like you said, he was jogging on it before he stopped running. And while mm-hmm. jogging, he had that cornerback beat already. If he just takes off, that cornerback wouldn't even be in the same area code. And we're we're mm-hmm. talking about a Packers win right now. Oh, and it, the safety was the safety wasn't anywhere close to that either. No, no, it was, it was a definite touchdown. Ugh. So, so yes, that's. It's it's just been every week, and something has to change. And, yes, one of these receivers needs to step up the way that James Jones did in the first six weeks, and he was just on fire. He was leading this offense. He was. And one, thing that, one, one thing that could definitely help, too, and it's it's not confirmed whether he's going to be playing. I think he was in – I'm not sure if it was full participation day, but uh, Aberderis seems mm-hmm. to be recovering from his injury better than expected. So if he's, if he's lining up for us, he's – He's the epitome of route running. That is how he made that, – that's, that's how he became an NFL prospect when he was playing in, at Wisconsin. He was a fantastic route runner and, and, and caught whatever was thrown at him. He's great mm-hmm. at that. If he can stay healthy, he's going to be a valuable weapon for us. So hopefully he'll be healthy for this game because he, he's, he can be a definite weapon against the Lions. Yeah, and where was, where was he nice playing play? when he – like the snaps he was in, where, he, where was he playing? Exactly, exactly where Richard Rodgers is playing now. Mm-hmm. It's not even Ty Montgomery. You put Abadaris in that role, and, and yeah. all of a sudden, that's a better team. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Couldn't agree more. So, so hopefully he's out there because we seem to know how to use him. He runs his routes. He doesn't quit on them. You know, he doesn't get alligator arms when he hears footsteps coming. You know, he stays in there and takes the hit, and you know he's a little bit fragile, so that ends up coming back to bite him in the butt. But he's tough. You can't no. deny that. We're talking about a rib injury. And, you know, I've had a couple rib injuries, one playing soccer and one being ejected from a motorbike driving in the streets of Hanoi, Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a story for life. another day. Rib's <laughs> <laughs> life. So that's a story for another day. But, you know, those, you know, the first couple weeks of my rib injuries, and I don't think they were even broken, they were just bruised, you know, I could, it was hard to breathe. It was hard to move. Sitting up was agony. Laying down was agony. Just everything hurt. And if he had a rib injury two weeks ago, really a week and a half ago, and he is in the mix to play in this game, that's toughness. Yes, yes. And I, that's what I like to see. That's what we need to see more of from these receivers. And Devontae Adams needs to take a page out of Aberdares' book because every freaking time a ball is thrown to Adams and he doesn't catch it, what's the first thing that happens? He doesn't say, oh, my bad. He doesn't run back to the huddle. He turns around and looks at the ref and puts his arms up as if he's earned some penalty. No. You know, and sometimes there have been penalties missed. Sometimes he you know, has. He's been yeah. grabbed, but it's been every time he doesn't catch the ball, he looks at the refs for them to bail him out from his lazy route running. Mm-hmm. Having said that, <laughs> let's move on to the predictions because this is the part where everybody seems to be a little bit more optimistic. Um, yeah, I, if you if you check out my post on Title Town Sound Off this week, I, I provide a little breakdown of the game coming up, and I don't have a lot of nice things to say until the end, where you know I, I go into Thanksgiving mode and take stock of what I'm thankful for with this Packers team. And what I am thankful for are the two most important parts of the team. It's the head coach and the quarterback because they have a great track record of, you know, they've had a few slumps in their time together, but they've always broken out of it. And we have a Hall of Fame quarterback throwing the ball for us right now, and you cannot keep a competitor like Aaron Rodgers down for long. So I call me foolish, call me a homer, call me whatever you want. I'm seeing this as the chance for us to get things going again. You know, playing on artificial turf, we can move the ball faster, we can run faster, all that kind of stuff, and call it blind hope, but 
we can run the ball more this week. There's no reason not to against a, a defense that is exploitable. Get Eddie Lacy going. You know, short screens, you know, the, the running back screens worked beautifully last week. They were a lot of fun to watch. Stop running screens to Richard Rodgers. I don't care who you run them to, just not Richard Rodgers. It's the worst possible way to use him. You know, just iron out some of these, you know, McCarthy called out some players this week, but it has to be coaches this week. Just get rid of some of these plays in the playbook, and your offense will run a lot smoother. And I think losing to the Bears at Lambeau on Brett Favre night had to be a wake-up call that, okay, some things need to change. Let's change them right now before our season is over. Because if they lose to the Lions and then Minnesota wins this week, we're back two games with a really bad division record. So, yeah, this is this is the week. Backs against the wall. Things are going to turn around. All right, what do you guys think? Dusty? Yeah, I got on 23. The Packers won in 23-17. Um, I, I, I've been having them. I think all my other predictions are higher scores. So I'm, I'm trying to adjust my expectations. I think in my entire life predicting Packers games, I don't think I've once predicted them to lose, even though I felt maybe they would. I can't do it, so I'm always gonna I'm always gonna predict the Packers win. I've tried to adjust expectations a little bit. They put up 16 on the lines of Lambeau. I I think they're gonna do a little better here, so I'm, I'm taking the Packers 23-17. Now hold on, I I believe that all of us picked the Packers to lose at Minnesota. That's nope. correct. Yeah, so well, you have picked the Packers to lose once. No, I predict them to win. That was game. he was he wasn't on the show that week. I don't think. Oh, that's what it was. Okay. That was Jason. That yeah, was you blamed him yeah. for okay. that. In, in my, right. in my heart, right. I knew the Packers were going to win that game. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you were just oozing confidence that week. <laughs> 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 oh, geez. All right. Um, I, sorry, so I forgot to give my score. I am I am picking the Packers, if that wasn't clear, and I'm going Packers 30 and 17 for the Lions. So, Jordan, what do you got? So I think the key to this game is we're not honoring a, a Packer great at halftime. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm picking, I'm picking, I'm picking the Packers to win. Um, I'm going 23-21. Um, I think there's going to be another frustrating game to watch. Um, that's going to come down to the fourth quarter and whoever can make make a play on offense in the fourth quarter, whether it be Stafford or Rodgers. I do think that's what it comes down to. Um, with the way with the way the Packers are playing, and also with the way the Lions are playing, we can't discount the way they've. They've actually shown up the past three weeks and, and played well, and they've they've, mm-hmm. they've played, played quite well. Um, this will be, I mean, obviously it's going to be no walk in the park. Nothing is a walk in the park for this Packers team, but this game is going to be a tough game to win um, mm-hmm. on the road. So, um, but with that, I, I am picking the Packers in a close one, twenty three twenty one. All right, that'd be a fun game to watch. Uh, the the reason I'm not losing with confidence this week is you know a lot of Packer legends were on the field at halftime. And among them was just one of the greatest linebackers to ever play the game. The great Bernardo Harris was in attendance. I think I and if Bernardo that. Harris does not get you motivated to play good football, I don't know what will. George Coons is also out there for what it's worth. Yeah, but Bernardo Harris. But George Coons. But Craig Newsom was also out there. What's, what's, Hi, Craig Newsom was one of my favorite players as a kid. Doug Evans. Just, Doug Evans was. Doug Evans was there. Doug as Evans well. was there. There were there were some greats. That was fun. I, I always like seeing Antonio Freeman's face. That was yeah. That was my favorite receiver growing up. You know, of course, everybody's favorite player was Brett Favre, but my favorite target of his was Freeman. Always loved I had a, him. I, I, I had I had a buddy of mine in college who was a, a big big Detroit Lions fan. Hated Brett Favre, obviously, but he always <laughs> told me he, he always told me, and he grew up in the you know, same same time as me. Obviously, he said Freeman was the man. He just mm-hmm. like Freeman, everything about that guy he loved, which is just you know for for him to say anything good about uh, any anybody anybody on the on the Packers was was saying something. Dude, Not Freeman mention, played oh. wide receiver in the NFL with a cast on his arm. Yeah, with an <laughs> actual <laughs> honest to god cast on his arm. And, and ripped it up when he was out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was that wasn't oh, like Reggie White using his 
like using it as a club and just beating men upside the head. With it. <laughs> he caught balls with his cast. Like, that's preposterous. It, it was. It was. It was preposterous. That's a really good word for it. And I loved his comments. I kept showing interviews during the game of different, uh, you know, former Packers. You know, Ron yeah. Wolf was interviewed, and Freeman's comment about how many dislocated fingers he had, and <laughs> suggesting that Brett in his locker had a running tally of how many fingers he dislocated on how many receivers. That killed me. (laughs) Oh, man, yeah. I I about died. Uh, That was great. Uh, (laughs) Probably the best moment of the game outside of halftime. I I think (laughs) there wasn't much else. There wasn't much else to cheer for, but Antonio Freeman opening his mouth is always good. (laughs) (laughs) All right. We have our predictions. We've we've gotten all kinds of negative, and we've gotten all kinds of positive. I, I think you know, considering the circumstances, I think we've done a pretty good job of keeping it, you know, not one hundred percent negative. To be fair, I think it helps that we're recording days after the game because I think if we had recorded after the game or the day after the yeah. game, I think this would have been way different. Yep. Yeah, and and. I I want to thank Jordan and Dusty because I did send them both a message right after the game saying, I want to record right now. I'm angry and I have things to say. <laughs> <laughs> but they kept me in check and we waited. And I think we actually had more positive things to say after this loss than we did after the Lions loss. So... To be fair, Brian, I had a lot of turkey. I just, I just didn't want to talk. Like, that's all it was for me. A lot of turkey, sure. a pumpkin pie in my system. I, I want to have a phone call on top of that. <laughs> yeah, no, my my wife, bless her. Uh, every time the Packers are losing, she kind of gets really quiet and kind of steps away so as not to rile me up. And she is <laughs> like, you know what? Yeah, I every year I hear the stat about domestic violence in Wisconsin skyrocketing <laughs> after a Packers loss, and I'm like, oh my goodness, I just want to be as far away from that stat as possible. And <laughs> you know what? Overall, I'm a very happy man. I live in a great city, and I have a good job and a great wife. I'm I have too much to be thankful for to let a loss in a game just dictate how I feel for the next six days. That just Ah, my goodness. I could go on another rant about that, but (laughs) ah, let's move on because I'm I'm dangerously close. All right, we'll talk a little bit around the league, get a couple more of our predictions. Um, Just to go back last week, you know, we each make three predictions every week, and last week is the first week I started keeping tabs on it, and it was not a good week for that. Uh, Combined, we went two and seven in our predictions, guys. Jordan and I each had one game right, and Dusty, Dusty had the hat trick. He was 0-3. But so close. But so close on those. But so close. <laughs> yeah. Well, what are you going to do? All right. Like, so I was let's very try close to being 2-1. To... I don't want people to know that. I was very close to being 2-1. <laughs> or even 3-0. Blah, blah, blah. It can, it can turn. It can just, it's, just, it's a fine line. A very fine line. Yeah, and the Packers almost beat the Panthers, Lions, and the Bears. Yeah, I know. But we, I know. but we didn't. Yeah, that's true. You're zero three, buddy. Deal with it. I know. <laughs> I'm trying to talk myself out of it, but you know, it's just the tears are overwhelming. <laughs> all right, so we all picked Packers. Let's talk our upset picks. Uh, Jordan, go ahead and start us off. It's it, it's getting to the point now where I'm I'm looking at the lines and I'm just I'm just kind of picking randomly. Which which upset I think might actually happen. Um, I'm not picking against Carolina anymore. I have learned my lesson. Um, <laughs> but the fact that I'm not picking against Carolina, maybe this is the week they finally lose, but probably not. Um, my upset pick this week, I'm actually taking the Houston Texans over the Buffalo Bills. Um, Houston's actually look, been looking pretty decent. Um, had a 24, I believe, 24 to six win. Over New Orleans this past week. Now New Orleans, New Orleans win is not something to write home about, but um, <laughs> they, they've, they've they've beaten a very good Cincinnati team, held them to six points. They're playing some good football right now, so I'll take them over the Bills. 
All right, yeah, and and JJ Watt, who you know got off to a little bit of a slow start, has been on fire lately, and that defense is just humming right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and just as we thought they would all year, but they're they're on fire right now, and they're in striking distance in that division. So, yeah, yeah I, I think that's a solid pick. Could be hosting. All right, I am. Game. Yeah, I am going with something that breaks my heart. You know, last week I picked Denver as my upset over uh, the Patriots, and that came true. That was my one that I got correct. And I'm a big fan of Brock Osweiler. At the very least, there's no way he's going to play as poorly as Peyton Manning has played lately. So, just I, I, I'm a big fan of his. I think he should keep the job. Having said that, it's a young quarterback, two starts in the league, coming off a hugely emotional win in prime time. This week is a letdown. They're playing at San Diego, who I actually picked to lose, but they they looked a lot better last week, got the win. I'm going to pick San Diego to beat Denver. It's it's kind of a stretch in my mind, but it's going to be a little bit of a letdown for Denver coming off an emotional win. Dusty, what do you got for us? First of all, I'd like to point out, I don't know if you guys have noticed this or not, that Brock Osweiler kind of looks like Robert Pattinson in Twilight. Like, yeah, like a, that's the upsetting part, yeah. Kind of like a, like a creepier, like more like receding hairline version of like <laughs> Edward Cullen. I mean, I don't know his name. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, I'd just like to point that out. That, that That's who you're rooting for, Brian. You know, having said that, he is infinitely better looking than Peyton Manning and John Elway. <laughs> and I live in Denver. Denver. Yeah. I live in Denver and all these billboards all over the city are plastered with Peyton Manning and John Denver's <laughs> faces and it is not pleasing. <laughs> so yeah. seeing Brock Osweiler on a few billboards would do this city a world of good. Also, uh so you you said uh I know you meant John Elway, you said John Denver, so I really like to imagine <laughs> that there are pictures of John Denver just all over Denver. <laughs> just on sides of buildings and billboards and all kinds of stuff. Everywhere. Anyway, Everywhere. He, he's pick... on the license plate here. <laughs> that sounds about right. Sure, the, yeah, the Mother Nature Sun guy, sure. Um, sure, sure. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go ahead. This is – I'm already starting out bad, guys. Uh, let's take San Francisco over to Chicago. San Francisco is going into Chicago – They've looked bad, but, you know, if I've said it once, I've said it a million times, I'm a believer in in Blaine Gabbert. And I think Chicago... Wah, wah. I know. I know. They're going to lose 72 to nothing. Um, I think (laughs) Chicago, it's a big win over Green Bay. They're starting to look a little better, but they're coming off kind of an emotional high. I think they're going to come down a little bit. Uh, San Francisco's defense has been better. Their offense actually has not been terrible. I know that's that's like damning praise that they've been better and not <laughs> terrible, but they've actually not looked as bad as I thought they were going to look. And I think Chicago has also – they've been playing better, but they're still not a very good team. But I think San Francisco is going to go to Chicago squeak out a victory. You know what? I, that would almost upset me. You know, I never want the Bears to win, <laughs> but if the Bears one week can come into Lambeau – and beat us, and then the next week go home and lose to the likes of the San Francisco 49ers led by Blaine Gabbert, that would be, oh my, the ultimate kick in the head. Man, it's all, all I want is Green Bay to win this game and people in Green Bay to still be upset. I want Green Bay to win this game by 60 and then still be mad that Chicago lost to San Francisco. <laughs> like, that's all I want. All right. If, all right. So, if the Packers win big in Detroit, and the Forty ers go and win in in Chicago, that should just be all we talk about next week. Yeah, I think that's. I think that's fair. Right, fair enough. We'll we'll talk about firing McCarthy and you know, <laughs> I don't know, maybe you know, raising Lambeau Field and building a new stadium and yeah, all those okay. all those we'll, we'll say things. We'll save that for the pre-draft podcast in uh, in March. Mm. <laughs> All right, fair enough, fair enough. 
All right, moving on. Uh, we have our Packers picks. We have our upsets. Let's go for our locks of the week. Dusty, kick us off. Carolina over New Orleans. Uh, Carolina's going into New Orleans. New Orleans is a just a steaming garbage pile of players at the moment. So, <laughs> what well, did they lose by this past week? Was it 24-6? Was that the score this past game? Yeah. 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 To it, Houston. Carolina, I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of Carolina. They've been playing better lately. I mean, that defense has been great all season. The offense mm-hmm. has really turned. They started slow, but the offense has actually been humming the past three or four weeks. Uh, mm-hmm. New Orleans has been, we talked about this last week, New Orleans has been historically awful, even by their lowly, lowly, lowly standards. So Carolina's going to go into New Orleans and just win by, I don't know, 40? <laughs> at least at least 20. Like, they're going by at least 20 going into New Orleans. So that's my line. I like it. I like and it. you can trust me because I won three last week. <laughs> <laughs> Two reasons I like the words that just came out of your mouth. One, you said a lot of really mean things about the Saints, and I love hearing that. <laughs> But two, you actually proved a point I had earlier by saying that offense is humming. That's another issue. You know, they lost their top wide receiver preseason too, and their offense has looked really good for most of the year. So another reason saying that us struggling on offense is because Jordy Nelson out. That's a cop out. The yeah, the number of receivers still move the ball. And they can I think their the number one receiver is Ginn. So yeah, we don't have any we don't have any room to complain about that. Right. You you're gonna tell me that Ted Ginn is better than uh, Randall Cobb or James Jones? It, it, no. Anyone the anyone the Packers have. No. It's, I do like no. Devin Funches, but Devin Funches is not great. So yeah, their wide receiver options are severely limited. No. Yeah, Devin Funches has looked good lately, and I think he will be a good receiver, but right now he's very raw. Mm-hmm. And uh, maybe he's at the level of Devontae Adams. But we just I'm, – I'm sorry there's, there's no excuse for it. Mm-hmm. All right, sorry. Moving on. Uh, my lock this week, and this one is kind of playing with cheat codes, I feel like, but Cincinnati over Cleveland – Cincinnati coming off a couple of disappointing losses, you know, a, a very tough, well-fought game in Arizona last week. Now they get to, you know, put their feet up and cruise through a game in Cleveland. That team is a mess, just like they have been for the past thousand years <laughs> or so, give or take five. Um, just the, the front office of that franchise is a joke, the coaching is a joke, the players, you know, they've, they've got some talent, but the quarterback position continues to be a punchline, and uh, people need to stop saying Johnny Football, just stop saying his name, just let it go, just like Tim Tebow, you just have to let it go, move on, Cincinnati's going to win big. The Bengals did run over the Rams last week as well, so... They're kind of, they are kind of kicking in the gear a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're they're coming they're coming back around after a couple more a couple disappointing weeks. Uh, I I do believe that you know their quarterback won another Super Bowl last week by beating the Rams. Right? Well, they're sitting nine and two, so four and one. three wins for every Super Bowl. Yeah, he's won three so far. Okay, for those for those new listeners. Earlier in the season, we talked about how some pundits were talking about how Andy Dalton has proven that he's gotten over his postseason struggles by winning a couple early in the season games, and we've just been mocking that every week thus far. <laughs> so, so he is up to three Super Bowls won this season. Uh, I, that's got to be some kind of record, right, guys? I don't think any other quarterback has ever won more than one Super Bowl in one season. I'd have to go through the numbers. Yeah, right. I don't think so. It's it's pretty impressive what he's doing this year. I think Tim Tim Tebow might have won two in one season with the Broncos. Well, one of those I think one was just based on his smile. So yeah, I think right, that was two. right. <laughs> and then that that overtime throw to Demarius Thomas against the that. Steelers. I that was another I Super Bowl. So yeah, I think I think that was both. I think that was both Super Bowls happened in that game. Okay, okay, yeah, because okay. so. yeah, then he smiled right after. So the smile. Yeah, I'll never, right, I'll never forget right. it. Yep. Yeah. Got it. That's cool. Right. So, I remember, so, yeah, I remember I, I when Tim Tebow smiled. 
But yeah, I'd I'd say Dalton, three win three Dalton Super Bowls in one well. season. Yeah. yeah, three Super Bowls in one season has to be a record. All right, Jordan, what do you got for us? Who's your lock? All right, I'm taking uh, I'm taking New England over uh, Philadelphia this week. The only hope really that Philadelphia has in this game, and I don't even really call it a hope, um, is that Rob Gronkowski is out for this game, which there are reports he's going to either miss a week or two. He might even play this game. Um, even if he doesn't play this game, I see absolutely no reason why New England won't win. They're coming off a loss. Belichick and Brady after a loss. I don't have the number for it, but I mean, this they, they don't lose back-to-back games. It, it doesn't happen in New England. This mm-hmm. game is in Foxborough. The Eagles' defense has looked absolutely atrocious for at least for, for the past two weeks, giving up forty plus points. There's nothing going here for the for the Eagles in this game. I'm I'm, I'm taking New England. I'm taking them big. I cannot wait. I all I'm going to do at the end of the year when Chip Kelly loses his job, all I'm going to do is Google pictures of his face. <laughs> I just want to see the look on his face when he loses that job. The man who he just rubs me the wrong way, the man who thinks he knows more than anyone else in the NFL, even though he's only been coaching in the NFL for three years. Oh, I can't wait to see him just tumble right back down to earth and somebody poke that giant inflatable head with a pin and watch his ego just deflate. I feel like you had this illustration uh, ready to go for this for this podcast. That was so I honestly man. didn't, and I, I don't even know what I just said. Everything just went black for like 12 <laughs> seconds. And I don't I, know. I kind of like, like Chip Kelly. Oh, man. Well, my, I think we've talked about this before. We have talked about this before. Like, one, like my second favorite college team is Oregon. It has been since I was a kid, so... I don't know. Oh yes, the Joey like, Harrington like, Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm Joe, yeah, I'm Joe Harrington fan. So what well, you realize Chip Kelly never brought you a national title though. So why no, do you I like know. him? All he I did was cheat and then leave your program in disgrace and yeah, run to the NFL before he got in trouble. Like everyone else. Like everyone else who leaves college football. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like Pete Carroll, who I also despise. Yeah, I don't like Pete Carroll. I don't like the way he chews his gum. A personal thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, next week on the podcast, Brian and Dusty just <laughs> fight each other for an hour and a half. <laughs> All right. Moving on, we've got our picks locked in. Let's go to our fantasy picks this week. And we have a trifecta all at one position, I believe. So, Jordan, kick us off. I'm actually going right back to that New England-Philadelphia game. Um, this is kind of um, banking on the fact that Gronkowski is off for this game, but um, if he is out, I'm, I'm, I'm picking Scott Chandler as my fantasy sleeper. Um, usually whenever a guy goes down, Brady's able to, to find one guy to, to, ma- to make his main weapon, and he'll be out. He'd be out Edelman, Amendola, and Gronkowski for this game. Scott Chandler's had a, a quite a few decent games over his career. He's, he's not a superstar by any stretch, but Oftentimes, superstars and oftentimes players in New England who aren't superstars can have very big performances. So, and if, if Gronk mm-hmm. is out, I see Scott Chandler having a big game on Sunday. All right, I like it. Keeping with the tight end position, I'm going with Luke Wilson in Seattle. Uh, Jimmy Graham out for the year, and you know Jimmy Graham has been really bad. He was he's been completely misused all year long and that's definitely on the coaches in Seattle. But Luke Wilson, as far as you know, pure tight end, he's the best one that Seattle has, even if Jim, Jimmy Graham is healthy. Now Jimmy Graham being out for the year, Luke Wilson is going to start to get those minutes. The guy has really good hands. He runs solid routes, and before teams have a chance to prepare for him, he's going to put up some big numbers this week. Dusty. Yeah, as you mentioned, also tight end. I, I was actually, while you were talking, I was listening to you intently, Brian, but I was also trying to see what the update on Heath Miller's injury was. Mm-hmm. There has not been one, as near as I can tell, from the game. The nearest I could find was one day ago, 
he left the which was you know Sunday. Uh, he left the game with a rib ailment. They didn't even say what was wrong with him; just a rib ailment. I didn't even see the hit that caused it. Uh, I think before halftime, Heath Miller jogged into the locker room and did not come back. So best guess: broken or bruised rib. Maybe Heath Miller is back this week. Maybe he is not. I'm kind of betting on him not being back. And so I'm mm-hmm. going to take uh, Jesse James. Uh, he came in after Miller got injured, didn't see too much action, two targets, one catch for eight yards. He did have a two-point conversion. Um, it, Roethlisberger loves his tight ends. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and so <laughs> I, I think he'll uh, – if, if Miller's out, he's going to look James's way. I don't think he's going to have – and, and in the same way, my pick last week of Inman, I don't think he's going to have a massive game. Like, he's not going to put up, you know, 10 catches for 200 yards or anything. But if you're hurting for a tight end, I think he's going to put up, you know, six, seven catches for 70 yards or something. Like, that's not that's not out of the question. Maybe a touchdown. He does like looking for him, looking for a tight end uh, in the red zone. So, uh, I think I think Jesse James is not going to have a huge game. He'll have a nice game uh, for, for a guy you can plug in for a week. This segment actually gives me a lot to think about because I have Rob Gronkowski on my fantasy team. So, uh, I'm not sure which one I should sign in case Rob Gronkowski doesn't play. I don't know. Whoever I pick is going to have the lowest point total. So I was going to say, like, you'll you'll pick up Jesse James, and then it turns out, like, five minutes before the game, he's going to say, oh, no, you know what, I'm playing. Yeah. Whatever your choice is, it's going to be wrong. Exactly, exactly. So why even try? I'm just going to sleep in. Yeah, I've, I've benched uh, C.J. Anderson this week and lost by two points. So I'm not, you know, I'm not kicking myself over that already. Ooh, oh, God. ooh, mm-hmm. that's rough. That's rough. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. just to embarrass Jordan a little bit, uh, <laughs> in the league that we're both in, he lost. <laughs> he lost in the playoffs, I think, in uh, the semifinal. Oh. <laughs> yes. because his running back at the very end of a game in week 15 had, I think he just took a kneel down, something like that, ran for negative one yard, and he lost by half a point. <laughs> nope, he, he had the it win. Was, uh, but it was, then... was, not, was not just any running back. It was DeMarco Murray, the DeMarco leading Murray. rusher in the league. I <laughs> oh. Why did he had to – this was, this, this was a good podcast, Brian. <laughs> that, was, that, was the best, that was the best shot. That was the best shot I had at a title in quite a long time. And oh, I got to think about that stupid play. Yeah, you're, no, you're right, Jordan. This was a good podcast, and I just made it great. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! All right. <clears throat> Before we get to our final thoughts, uh, I have one very exciting announcement for the podcast. Pack to the future can now be found on Packers Talk Radio Net. So there are so many ways that you can find us now. We're on Packers Talk Radio Net. You can follow them on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. You can find us on iTunes uh, by searching for Pack to the Future. You can find us on TitletownSoundOff.com. There's a little tab toward the top that says Pack to the Future, and you can click on that, and all of our episodes are listed there. So we are now all over the Internet. We are taking over. Very exciting. Very exciting. We're we're very happy to be a part Good of the Packers Talk Radio Net family, and hopefully that brings in some new listeners. If if there are new listeners, we're glad to have you. You picked a good show to start listening because you got to hear about Jordan's fantasy football struggles. <laughs> All right, final thoughts, guys. What do you got, Jordan? Oh. I just 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 win the game. Just win the game on Thursday. <laughs> that's, that's, I have no more thoughts. I've thought everything that needs to be thought and said everything that needs to be said. They just need to go out and win. All right, simple. I like it. That's all. That's all. That's all I got. <laughs> Dusty, final thoughts. Yeah, probably about the same as Jordan. I I did get a question come in from uh, James Corsmo, uh, the writer at Title Town Sound Off that I'd like to mm-hmm. bring up. Um, his question is, if Aaron Ripkowski was a household appliance, what would he be and why? My answer really is... That's a easy question. What, what's, your, what's your answer? He's a garbage disposal. 
<laughs> I don't I don't know what other answer you can have. That man just tears stuff apart. Um, I would say just I would say a clothesline because he's very, I think he's very useful, but uh, but McCarthy's never going to use him. <laughs> Jordan. <laughs> Oh man, you guys are you guys are putting me on the spot. Hey, we both had answers. Yeah, I would have, we we could have gone over this in the prep for the podcast. Oh man, I apologize. It, it came up it came up while we were recording. I apologize. I'm 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 I'm, 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 I'm in my I'm, I'm in my kitchen right now looking at appliances, and none of them are, are Aaron Rukowski. I don't I don't think he's a toast. I don't think he's a toaster. I don't think he's a slow cooker. Um. Pressure cooker? Nah. Mine wasn't even an appliance Pressure cooker. cooker. It was just Pretty something good. that some people have. Who uses a clothesline anymore? Cookers. My answer's not even the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, well, Dusty had time to think about this. I'm the only one that had a legitimate answer. Yeah, I apologize. That was a good one, too. I thought of, like, I thought about it, but it wasn't very good. So, um, yeah, okay. So, we've got that. But, yeah, final thoughts. Win. Um, I'd love to see, man. I'd love to see the receivers just run some routes this week. That'd be like, nice. don't no drifting back. Don't round your corners. Just when you run a 15 yard dig, you stick your foot in the ground at 15 yards, and you and, and you run towards the middle of the field. That, none of this rounding stuff. I, if if they're gonna win, if they we talked earlier, if we think they're going to make the playoffs, so I think they will. But they want to make the playoff. They've got to do this stuff, Brian. I think that was you that was talking about the little things they need to fix. This is one of the little things they need to fix that would be a very, very big thing. If they can get their route running down, if they can stick with what works, stick with the running game, or stick with, if Jake Ryan's doing well at linebacker, I don't care what it is. If you've got something that's working, you just just stick with it and just. For the love of God, man, just just run a crisp route. That's that's all I ask. I hear it. All right, um, I, I have two. One, yeah, I hate to go back to negative, but you know, we we talked ad nauseum about you know who carries the blame for a lot of things going wrong this season, and one guy who, for some reason, does not get enough of the blame is Ted Thompson, and you know. I like that he's a draft first guy. I like that's I like that the that's that oh, sorry. I like that that's how he builds his team. Overall I think that's the best way to go, but you gotta complement that with a little bit more action and free agency. You know, we came into this season with two glaring holes at inside linebacker and tight end. And we brought guys in for visits at both positions and for some reason just didn't sign anybody in a year where we just had enormous amounts of cap space, even after re-signing our own players. And I, I think that that has come back to bite us in a big way because we have very little production coming out of tight end and little production coming out of linebacker, out inside linebacker, other than Clay Matthews, who switched positions last year. And something's got to give. You, at, at some point, you have to start using all the weapons at your disposal. The other thought, and I'll bring this up because we have another tweet from our resident Bears fan, uh, Brian Aviles, who, by the way, you can find on Twitter, at BrianBBL148. And he said, can you guys talk about the really bad officiating, not just during that game, but all season long, it seems. And yeah, it, it kind of has been a problem. And the one play that sticks out, uh, Rodgers drew the Bears offside, and usually that's a free play, and he found Cobb, and it probably would have been a touchdown because he was wide open, but for some reason they called that play dead instead of letting the play unfold, and that probably cost us seven points. We didn't score on that drive. It was a huge bummer. And, mm -hmm. you know, yes, the officiating has been bad, but I think the bigger problem is the rule book and so many rules that are up for interpretation instead of just being clear-cut, this is what it is, makes the job for, for an umpire, an official, just so difficult. You guys have any thoughts yeah. on that? I mean, yeah, that's, that's true. I, the, the rule book is convoluted for sure, but it's been convoluted for a while. 
and I don't remember a season quite like this. It might just be a case of recency bias. I'm not entirely sure, but it does seem like there's been more blown calls, especially more blown calls in big moments than I've seen in a long, like since since the replacement refs. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not been a good season, and I sure. don't think that can all be blamed on the rule book. All right, Jordan. I'd love to see. I'd lo- I'd love to see the stat of like how many new just officials there are in the league. It seems like a lot of the head referees that have just been around forever. I mean, you got Hockley and Triplett and um, uh, Gene Steratore and just 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 those guys that have been around for. I mean, it seems like forever. Like I don't remember the time when those guys haven't been, you know, he- head referees. So it's just weird that these guys that have been around for so long seem to be having so I mean and, and it's these guys that are having the trouble. I mean mm-hmm. hockey is through the past couple of years it have, have been at the center of quite a bit of controversy. So mm-hmm. it's 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 confusing with with that much experience at hand and it and it does go to a changing a changing rule book and and that obviously doesn't make their job easier. It's it's, it's not a job I would want at all. Right. <laughs> I mean, right. it, no. they they, they got to be they got to be on their toes for every single play, and mistakes are bound to happen. They just seem to be happening at the worst possible times for some teams. Mm-hmm. Man, I'll, I'll tell you what's kind of blowing me away a little bit is when he was in the league. I really liked Mike Carey. He really yeah. he was very good. Gave good explanations. Hockey is kind of known for drawing out these explanations. Kerry gave really good explanations, was very concise about him, seemed to be right more often than not. His crew was always really good. They've mm-hmm. got him now on CBS, and he seems like he doesn't even know what he's talking about. All the time. I have no <laughs> idea how he was a competent ref. He's explaining this stuff, and, and he doesn't even... There was a moment in this past week, I'm blanking on which game it was, when they were getting ready to make the call on the field, and they asked him, which way do you think this should go? And he was just silent. Just didn't say a word until the call was made. And he was like, yeah, no, I think that I think that was the right call. But even before that, it seemed like he didn't really understand what he was talking about, and that blows my mind because he was actually pretty good on the field. So yeah, I I, I don't know, man. I don't, I don't know. It could be it, it could be it, to 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 kind of add something more to that. It, it could be the fact that he knows all these guys and. Maybe if you know him in more of a position of of just of media presence. I mean, we see him every week on CBS, and he's, he's they bring him in for all of these calls. He knows these refs, so and he, he and he has had that um, tendency to not really make a decision. Like he'll talk about the play, but he won't really say one way or the other. And maybe it's just because he doesn't want to say what he thinks and have the other official give a bad call and you know make him look like maybe he's just trying to save face for his former colleagues. I don't know. That could be. Yeah, I, mean, I wasn't. I wasn't the biggest fan of Pereira when he first started doing this, and I'm still not a big fan of him now. And mm-hmm. he he did kind of have those tendencies a little earlier, not to the point that Kerry has, but he did kind of have those. Yeah. You're, you're right. He kind of had those his first season or two. It was kind of a explain the rule, don't make an opinion. And since then, he's been more like, this is how this should be because of this and this and this. And I still don't love him, but right. he's been more decisive than Kerry is. So you're right. That, that could be what it is. I hope that's what mm-hmm. it is. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. Hopefully we've got some new listeners being on Packers Talk Radio. That would be great. Uh, Make sure, if you're listening to us, that you're also listening to the guys at Titletown Sound Off. Uh, They're really good. Uh, They also like us, so that makes them very smart. So (laughs) so go check them out. They're awesome. Uh, Guys, tell everybody how to find you on Twitter. Dusty? I am just at Dusty Evely. The last name is E V E L Y. Jordan, and you and you can find me at at J G Peck four one J G Peck forty one. And I am at T T S O underscore Brian. And make sure you're also following our podcast Twitter at P T T F underscore podcast. Thank you everybody for listening. Go Pack Go. Go Pack Go. Go Pack Go! Our 
Are you looking for some signed Packer memorabilia? Look no further than Waukesha Sports Cards. If the Green Bay Packer can sign it, Waukesha Sports Cards has it. Check our website for upcoming Packer player and legend signing. Go to WaukeshaSportsCards.com. Eddie Lacy, Mike Daniels, Gilbert Brown, Don Barclay, Micah Hyde, your Green Bay Packers, yesterday's legends and today's superstars. From corporate or nonprofit events to private parties, add some spice. Hire a Packers player from Mayfield Sports Marketing. For details, just go to PackersTalk.com and click on Player Appearances.